Broadcast Network, AfterBuzz TV. Over 20 million weekly downloads in over 150 countries and your number one source for after-show entertainment. Oh, AfterBuzz TV. After Buzz TV. The destination for TV superfans. Producing after shows for over 300 of your favorite TV shows. Interviewing celebrities and showrunners. And bringing you behind the scenes exclusives. All thanks to E! Entertainment's Maria Menounos, producer Kevin Undergaro, and internet leader Akamai. Now, let the buzz begin! Hello and welcome to an all new UFC on AfterBuzz TV. My name is Daria Baranato and I'm here with my co-host, as always, Mr. George Hermosa and Mr. Jay Tan. Hi guys. Hey lady. What's up? <laughs> George, you have gloves on. I, I have to ask, are you cold? No, I'm not. He's playing vocal protest. I had the same gloves that I had last time. Okay. Tis the season, right? No. Oh, okay. With two sprites... And, and a bag home, of homemade wonderfully cookies. well-made homemade cookies. Yeah. Uh, we, George we, is in position here. I don't exactly know for what, but I guess it is tis the season for, for George here. Mm. <laughs> Good cooking. Those are frozen cookies. You know, the, the little kids movie, Frozen? And they have, no, I How are they frozen? I've never seen it. And they have upside down hearts on them. How are they upside frozen? Down. Turn if, them upside down, they won't be. If anyone can comment on the YouTube link and tell Jay oh, what Frozen is. I know what Frozen the movie is, but why do the why are the cookies necessarily frozen? Because of the blue hearts. I don't know. They're frozen themed. I saw them in the oh, store. And they, was that I was it? like, oh, that's so cute. So mm-hmm. they're not homemade? No. I, I thought they were homemade. What the? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> Blasphemy and... Hey, can I get those cookies back? They were so Cuisine good. plagiarism going on here. <laughs> you thought they were homemade? Darn yeah. right I did. There was no forgery here. There was no... I was giving Christina all the props in the world for that. Oh, Turns out you. it's just a, a whack, fake... Yeah. I, we've been hoodwinked. Shimmy-shammed. They, they... Bamboozled. <laughs> Darn right, kids. All right. They were heated up to the perfect temperature. Even the crowd's that upset. That takes science. <laughs> even the crowd's upset. Yes, even the crowd's upset. Our, uh, our fans sitting in today. Whatever, guys. <laughs> Hate all you want. They're frozen-themed cookies, and they're awesome. Okay, guys, another thing that was awesome was this fight card. We had the the return of Nate Diaz. We had a bunch of heavyweights. The which return is, of Junior Dos Santos. His the first fight in 14 Dos months. 14 months. It's gone by so fast. Since I didn't he even got, realize it was that long. Not murdered, but since he got hypothetically murdered by Cain Velasquez in the... It's not a hypothetical. Th- proverbially, maybe. <laughs> not hypothetical. Metaphorically. Figuratively. Yes. <laughs> figuratively. Not literally, obviously. Yeah. But Anything he, he, but he literal. He did get a beating against mm-hmm. Cain Velasquez. And, and it was quite the contrary, this fight. He, mm. he gave a beating himself. He yeah. did very well. It kind was a really competitive match. Easily. Very, very competitive match. One more for well, Fight of the Night. Well, let's start from the bottom. Let's start from the bottom. <laughs> Go all the way to the top. All the way to the top. Uh, just like I do on my dates. So we have Matt Mitrioni versus Gabriel <laughs> Gonzaga. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Mitrioni won uh, Mitri- via TKO in round one. Then we have, uh, I'm just going to run through the results yep. and we'll talk about them. Alistar, the Reem over Reem, defeated Stefan Skyscraper. We know why he is called Skyscraper. Oh my <laughs> Lanta. How tall is it? The seven foot tall? I think uh, he's technically seven foot tall, but he doesn't want to say he's seven foot. So he says yes. he's six, six, 11 and a half. 11 and a half. Either or he might way, as well say 6'12. Yeah. <laughs> throw people off, you know? Yeah, so uh, that was Stefan Struve. He is very, very tall. Yeah. And y- you said you've met Alistar Overeem, and you were up to, like, his shoulder. I, yeah, um, if that may be. More, more like, kind of peck, peck level, oh you know, gosh. just eye, eyes to nipples, practically. And he's only 6'4". Um, <laughs> only 6'4". <six four. laughs> only 6'4". Yeah. Get four. it, because Jay's short. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, he defeated Stefan Struve uh, in round one via KO. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about that later. I thought it was a TKO, but it was actually a KO. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rafael Dos Anjos defeated Nate mm-hmm. Diaz. Uh, he won via unanimous decision. We'll talk about that one as well. Very interesting. And then the main event of the evening, as Bruce Buffer would say, we had JDS Junior Dos Santos uh, defeated Stipe Miochi via split or unanimous decision. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. That was also a close one. We'll talk about yeah. that later. Let's start at the bottom. Gabriel, is that Napal? Napal, yep. Napal, Gonzaga, uh, and Matt Mitrione. What'd you think? Gabriel Gonzaga is going to always be known for his the brutal guy that finished knockout Mirko of Mirko Krokop yep. in brutal fashion. 
So props to him. I mean, that was Crow Cop years ago. I mean, a little still past his prime, but it's still... Yeah, in, in the prime enough. Yeah. Um, it was one of his first matches in, uh, I believe, maybe the second match in the UFC. Yeah, because he had Eddie... Uh, oh, Eddie Crow somebody. Yeah, Crow Eddie, Cop. Oh, yeah. No, not Eddie. Eddie... It was Eddie somebody that we never heard again from in a major league. I know who you're talking about. I just yeah. completely forgot his name. Um, so this was... Uh, yeah. Uh, Gonzaga knocked out Crow Cop, but that was many years ago and not the match we should be talking but about. But nonetheless, noting that he's actually he's a got so he's got tender. knockout power. Right, he, he knocked him out with a with a mm-hmm. with a leg kick, so he knows that he's not just a knockout artist, mm-hmm. but he's also actually a really good submission too. Yeah, yeah a he's a good competitor in, in this division. But Matt Matrione, guys, mm-hmm. I mean, former NFL player, obviously has the athleticism of that. He is his movement. His, his stride, he never stopped in this fight. And mm-hmm. I think, like I said, the athleticism between the two, I think that's really what separated this fight. Uh, Matt was fast. He was on point for sure. Um, dropped, uh, I'm see, um, Gonzaga almost dropped uh, Mitrione with that uh, kind of a strike. It was early in the uh, early in the round, strike and stepping on his foot. And Mitrione lost yeah. balance. But, he hit him uh, in his chest and it kind of... Flew him backwards, but yeah. then we looked at the replay, and he actually stepped on his foot. So it was more of like a trip. I don't yeah. think the actual punching power is what threw uh, Mitrion Indeed. backwards. And then Mitrion came back uh, with, with a flurry. Uh, left hook drops Gonzaga, and he just fires away, following up with rights on the ground. And he um, kind of backs up a little bit. But Herb, I think it was Herb Dean? Yeah. He never called Herb. the fight, so it's kind of like... That, yeah, that weird. was a funny thing. He Mitrion landed several uh, several shots on uh, on Gonzaga when he was down. Figured the round was over, but Herb hadn't stepped in and touched either of the fighters yet. Right, and you know, and it's funny that uh, that kind of plays uh, uh, plays in uh, in one of the earlier prelim matches uh, as well regarding the you know the, where the referee is. Um, but uh, <laughs> it was Mitrion steps away, and then he steps back in to throw a couple other shots before Herb Dean uh, jumps in there. Well, I think that's part of the reason why they called it a KO and not a TKO mm-hmm. because had they stopped it right there, it probably would have been a TKO. No, it was uh, being my, set. My notes say TKO here. Yeah, he wasn't knocked out. He was just oh, not defending. I'm himself. jumping to the next one. That's yeah. Alistair. Everyone, we'll talk about that later. Um, but yeah, no left hook to amazing ground and pound. You're right. He stepped back, took that time, and then went back and finished it with a nice flurry on the ground there. Yeah. I've always been a fan of Mitrion since we saw him on the uh, on Ultimate Fighter. Ultimate, Ultimate Fighter. Fighter finalist. Meathead. So he, he was one win away from being the Ultimate Fighter. Then of course he lost to Roy Nelson. Yeah, but still a, he was, was uh, big, uh, guys. He was in the season uh, ten. It was season ten of Ultimate Fighter, the heavyweights. And there were three different guys uh, that came from the NFL uh, on that. It was it was rather I'm kind sorry. of a, he wasn't a finalist. I'm sorry. That's what I thought. I wasn't mm-hmm. quite sure, but uh, kind of a star-studded cast uh, of, of Ultimate Fighter at that point. You mm-hmm. had Kimbo Slice was in the uh, uh, was in the house, and that was coming off of him setting a record for largest, uh, I believe. Network or TV rating for MMA, uh, his match against it was either James Thompson or Kimbo or uh, Tank Abbott. I'm sorry, but Kimbo was a name at the time, and yet here he comes into essentially the the, the proving grounds of the UFC. Uh, Roy Nelson was there, and of course he was quite a character. A lot of people didn't know who he was, so here's this you know big fat roly poly guy um, coming in and, and and tapping guys out, and you know going uh, going as far as he did. Um, Brandon Schaub was also there. And he Schaub, was, he was the right. finalist. I'm sorry. He was the finalist who lost against Roy Nelson. Brandon right. Schaub, uh, Matt Mitrione was one of them. And uh, who was the other one? It was, um, I'm looking here at notes of Marcus the Darkness something Jones? or other. Marcus Jones? No, give me, oh, was it Jones? I think it was, yeah, Marcus Jones. Um, All so, three NFL veterans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, Mitrione has, even by his own, his own uh, remarks, and an acknowledgement has really grown and matured right in front of UFC fans. Mm-hmm. He's had some ups and downs, you know, lost a couple and then came back. Um, but I've always thought he's the, he's very engaging. You listen to him and he's got something to say. And, you know, his matches are, are super fun. He's, he's, you know, he has his irreverence uh, as well as very valid points when he's um, when he's being interviewed. And then, you know, he's super fast quite large and and can move very well for for a big man he's got good heavy hands and great cardio for a guy that size mm-hmm. we don't see yeah. that much movement in a lot of those heavyweight yeah. fights but probably, he, he probably certainly comes from moves. that football background definitely. They, you go through a lot of cardio in there too mm-hmm. mostly in in practice oh definitely 
So I'm hoping that this is the beginning of uh, you know this three fight win streak. Now he I hope see- we see him go go farther. In in his in his interview after his fight, he just seems like he's a guy that's that's ready to prove himself. You know what yeah. I mean? Not that he necessarily needs to. But it's it seems like he's on a rant and he's on he's on a rampage and he's mm-hmm. on his way to the top and he really isn't going to stop trucking until he gets there. Yeah, I think the maturity has caught up with his physical attributes and skills. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah now's his time. If if we've ever seen Mitrione at his best, I think this is it. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, we're in the midst of his uphill climb. I hope so. I hope I really so. Do. I mean, he's ranked number fourteen. Mm-hmm. So you guys, you have guys like Bren, Ben Rothwell. Overeem, who's above him, mm-hmm. maybe match him up against Overeem, which kind of segues into the next. Fight. And there we go. <laughs> Alistar the Reem over Reem defeats Stefan Sk- Skyscraper Struve uh, via round one KO. This is the KO that I, I would have thought was a TKO, but yeah. looking back at it, I could see how it would be a knockout. Uh, takedown by over Reem in round one. Um, he played guard for. He mm-hmm. played guard, found an opening, and finally finished it with some ground and pound. Yeah. There was a moment there, though, where it was just so like nerve wracking to watch because. Uh, Stefan Struve was on his back. Mm-hmm. He had his legs pointed upward towards Overeem, who was hovering over him. Mm-hmm. And he was against the cage, correct? What's that? He was against the cage? Yeah, he was uh, near the near the wall. He wasn't like okay. up against it, though. Yeah. And it was like the moment where Overeem either needed to shoot in, get past that guard, mm-hmm. you know, or land some big ground and pound. But his le- Stefan Struve's legs were so long, yeah. making it so hard to get in on. Because mm-hmm. you're worried about up kicks. Talk about an up kick. I mean, there aren't bigger up kicks than right. from Stefan Struve. Mm-hmm. But he made a very, very good move. He got past it. He used his speed and landed some awesome ground and pound and finished it there. Yeah, Overeem I mean, was on point here tonight. Struve is no no slouch either. I mean, no. his height is his biggest advantage. I mean, that guy can just submit you because his limbs are so long. He can just grab you in a triangle before you even know it. He submitted guys that way. I think he made something like Pat Berry, I believe, or mm-hmm. LeVar Johnson. Right. Um, and he's got some knockout power, too. Yep. Yeah. So, so no, you know, he might be lanky, but he's still got some strength in you. This was, uh, I believe, his first match back from yeah. his... Uh, he's had a storied year, as, as it were, medically speaking. First, uh, I believe about a year ago, uh, Struve was diagnosed as having an aortic heart valve issue right. that could have been... Uh, life-threatening had it not been caught early enough. Um, He was able to, uh, rehab is the wrong word, but um, normally in one of these scenarios, I've seen it before, uh, actually with another fighter, um, you actually have to go in, open heart surgery, and replace that valve uh, either with, I think, like a a bovine uh, heart piece or a, um, a mechanical one. In which case, I believe you actually have to change it every 10 years or so. So open heart surgery every decade. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Um, so far, though, that was not the case with um, with Struve. Mm. Uh, he was able to get cleared, I believe, for not July. He was supposed to fight in July against was Matt Mitrioni. That's uh, right. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But he actually fainted before the fight. Right. Which mm-hmm. They blacked much, out yeah. that yeah behind the scenes and had to cancel that one. And this was his uh, his comeback match. Kind of ironic, then, really, that uh, him and Mitrione fought on the same card. On the same card, when, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, that also. If he would have won, we could have put that. I could have seen that matchup being next, mm-hmm. getting that rematch. But now I see Alistar Overeem being a great match for Matt Mitrione. I mean, no. I mean, Alistar. I like the fact that he kind of was patient because mm-hmm. he was able to drop uh, Struve with a good takedown. And most guys would maybe let him up because then he backed up a little bit. He, he tried to let him up. Right. No, no, he didn't let him up. But he kind of just kind of a little calculated, if you kind of notice. And then he just kind of got in and ended up finishing the fight. Right. Well, it's, it's that moment where someone's on their back with, you know, with an open guard and you're mm-hmm. standing above them. You either back up and tell them to stand with you mm-hmm. or you decide to, to wait for your shot and get in there. And it's interesting because in this case, of course, Overeem being the elite level kickboxer that he's right. been in his past, um, this, I believe, was the fir- the tallest guy that he's ever faced. So it's not like he's very used to dealing with this body type, you know, long and lanky. Right. And Struve, obviously, with his knockout power, Overeem is coming off of... I believe two knockouts, two. Yeah, it must be like, like two, um, two, uh, two Bigfoot, uh, Bigfoot Silva, and Travis Hoppa Brown. Mm-hmm. You also you know. Ben Rothwell as well. Rothwell, yeah. Um, so you know, you, you may want to. He he may have been conserving, testing his chin, mm-hmm. um, and deciding just to over strengthen 
uh, Struve in his guard, which obviously did work for that matter. It's crazy because this weight class, more than any other weight class, the body builds are so drastically different. They can be so mm-hmm. dramatically different. And it really does, you can't, you can't hide from the fact that it plays a part in the game. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have guys like like Stefan Struve that are seven foot tall, and it's so funny you use the word lanky. When I think lanky, I think like you know a slim person. Right. He still has so much muscle mass and so much body mm-hmm. composition that you know saying the word lanky sounds funny, but it's true. Yeah. His build compared to Alistair Overeem, who's you know more kind of looks like a wrestler compared to oh. him. Yet like he's a, a world class kickboxer. Like a freak of nature. That's what he looks like. Yeah, he does. It's so crazy, though. Uh, a lot of I, horse meat eaten in mm. uh, Alistair Overeem's Especially uh, when he used to fight, what, as a middleweight back in the day? Uh, well, middleweight in Pride, which was 205 uh, right. for, for our intense purposes, yeah. Um, one other point I was going to make, though, about uh, uh, about this, which I'm completely blanking. <laughs> it's flown away. Forget well, about well, it. Well, <laughs> the KO versus the TKO. I know what it was. When he no- go well, ahead. Then go ahead. <laughs> I, After I was, you. In in heavyweights, uh-huh. the limit is two oh six all the way up to two sixty four. Two sixty two sixty six technically with a one pound leeway. Right. So, you know, that's a huge gap of as you as you talked about, a huge gap of, of body mass and mm-hmm. weight. So you can have many different kinds of bodies in there. Whereas with all the other ones, there's only a ten pound difference. Right. Fifteen between welter and middleweight, but uh, but to um, note that ten pound like one twenty five. There's a limit. One, yeah, one thirty five is a way bigger difference than two fifty five and two sixty five. Once mm-hmm. you're that big, I mean, come right. on, what's ten pounds? But but he, it does give you the the leeway for a body type to look as varied, as varied as they do. Yeah, exactly. That's what gives us the dynamic that, that we have. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, the to versus the ko tko. So. I originally thought it was a TKO because, he, you know, he knocked him down on the ground, but he As didn't did look to be asleep, and then he finished it. But I think what mm-hmm. happened was that once he was on the ground, there was like a, a pause between, you know, the TKO and the KO. He actually came back in, and I think there was another shot was on the shot ground. a shot that woke him up? No, I think he was awake on the ground. Okay. Just stunned, you know. Mm-hmm. They could have called the fight possibly, but he hit him again on the ground. I think he actually went to sleep with that. Mm-hmm. final hit and that was the KO that was the KO so okay. we rarely see that usually you know the KO is the shot from that goes yeah. from standing to the ground but. I was a bit surprised by that as well right but, uh, I mean good for Overeem because he's kind of had an up and down career or it, since he got into the UFC he's a bit right. checkerboarded um, right now yeah came in beating one of the top heavyweights ever Brock Lesnar and then losing his next two mm-hmm. um, of course there was some controversy with steroids and elevated testosterone so yeah hopefully this one can just get him back on a uh, Back on the up, you know? Back on the up, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a guy that has all the potential in the world. I remember following over him for years now. Um, he's been around forever. And I think that, once again, just like Matt Matrion, now is his time. Yeah, I mean, he actually holds a victory over the interim UFC heavyweight champion. A rather boring fight, might I add. But it's still a, vi- <laughs> yeah. it's still a victory, you know? That was right. a, a strategy game, if mm-hmm. anything. Um, you know, it's funny, again, these, these two heavyweight matches going back to back. I don't know if it was something that Joe Silva was, was planning on, but Matt Mitrione versus uh, Overeem makes sense to makes me. Sense, yeah. You know? Right. Both of them are coming off of first round uh, striking finishes, we'll say. And the, with Reem ranked at number 11, Mitrione at number 14. It's a challenge to step up for, for Mitrione in terms of... Um, you know, pedigree and, and how far he can go, but that's what he wants. And Overeem needs another uh, another very decent match, you know, I think to prove himself and keep I think going. you're right. I think it's a perfect stepping stone for Matt Mitrione, and I, I think it's the perfect kind of platform for Alistair Overeem uh, to get those couple wins that, mm-hmm. that he needs and, and, and to move his way on up. Yeah. I think it's perfect. With that said, I think uh, Gabriel Gonzaga versus Stefan Struve makes a good, a good amount of sense, too. For yeah, the, the losers for versus fight. the winners. That would be great. God, look at that. They were 11, 12, 14, and 15. Yeah. Let's book it. Works perfect. I think you I heard got it, a new Joe job. Silva. I, was gonna say, I think I got a new job. Sorry, Joe Silva. You're, you're going to be replaced. <laughs> Kick them on out, George. Uh, next, we had Javier Dos George Silva. <laughs> George Silva? Yeah. That's right. I like it. You'll have to it change your nice name to, to, to take the, uh, the gig. You'll do that, right? Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Hmm. Hmm. I Think wonder. about that one Think for about a second. Uh, next, we have Rafael Dos Anjos, number three, versus Nate Diaz, number 14. Mm-hmm. Nate Diaz, Nate Diaz, Nate Diaz, Nate Diaz. Can we talk about first 
the pre-fight Dance, antics um, of Nate God, Diaz. We'll I think we have that. to, yeah. Uh, From the sublime to the ridiculous here. <laughs> Nate Diaz, first of all, weighed in on the scale at 160. Well, before that... One, actually, 160.6. Yeah. You got to add on that 0. 0.6 because it actually does make a big difference. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, if this is a, if this is a title fight, you can't even be 0. 0.1 over the scale. Mm-hmm. Right. You got to be at the exact amount. They usually give you, like, a pound... Um, if it's not if it's a non-title fight, you know, if you're 155, right. you can be 156. You know, it's, they're not going to find you or nothing. Well, but. it's not just the the weight thing. That certainly, yeah, I think, was the icing yeah. on the on the cake. Unfortunately, uh, Nate coming off of well, we we haven't talked about it yet, but uh, the UFC uniforms, the announcement uh, about a week ago, week mm-hmm. and a half or so, uh, that those were coming. Nate Diaz had a very vocal and strong uh, response to that that he posted on Twitter saying basically F you with the bird flying, which is generally not a very good professional way to handle your response to a corporate policy, whether you like it or not. But of course, the it's Diaz, a Diaz brothers, brother. Yeah, the Diaz brothers are going to oh, yeah. do that when regardless. He, when he did that, I was kind of like, okay, typical Diaz response. Right. Okay, whatever. Not a big deal. And right. then, of course, just voicing his opinion, but this, the other announcement about CM Punk signing with the UFC, Nate was very vocal about that one as, as well. Uh, F him, makes us all look like amateurs. This is BS, da 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 da. Um, and again, you know, he's got full right to express his opinion, and there's a lot of people out there that agree with him. Made some very valid points. But that one-two punch, (laughs) coming off of a year-long layoff when he's been complaining about not making enough money when he's got a signed contract, um, you know, all of this pile, all this piles up is bad, bad will with the company. Did you see that he walked out of that pre-fight interview? And he walked out of a (laughs) pre-fight interview Ah! as well. These, These things that you tape beforehand to bumpers to run before your match or before the tail of the tape. Uh... Fox Fox Sports 1 played a clip of it. Shame that we don't have it, but uh, I believe one question was asked, uh, what was it? What makes Rafael Dos Anjos so dangerous to you? So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and just proceeded to, to walk off. He was done with it. He's like, I'm done with this. You guys yeah. can do whatever you want. I'm I mean, sorry I'm being a dick. But yeah, yeah. He, he mentioned on his way out that he was sorry for being a dick. Now, there's most, you can get away with a lot of things if you perform in the cage and if you continue to be that guy that fans want to rally well, that, behind, behind and see. That's the thing. You can get away with it if you keep the fans appeal. If you get in the cage, mm-hmm. put on a war, prove yourself. And they win. Will let you do, Yeah. They will <laughs> let you do whatever you want. And that's the honest to God truth. I mean, maybe the company won't, which is up to their judgment. But yeah. if you're if you're playing, you know, going to WWE terms, the, the heel or the face, if you're mm-hmm. playing that character, that role... And you're doing it well, and you're still an amazing fighter. You know, like Conor McGregor. He talks a lot of crap, but he wins, and he, mm-hmm. you know, has some impressive wins. Uh, it, it can work. Yeah. But when you get in there and you do what Nate Diaz did. Which Nate could not, uh, he couldn't find his range with uh, with Dos Anjos. Dos Anjos was picking him apart with leg kicks. You know, I, one part of it, I, I think that. From watching the Diaz brothers for so long, I think one thing that we can agree on is that when the cage door closes and the uh, the bell rings, they're in their element. They love to fight. They're good at it. It comes naturally. I think it's how they express them- themselves. Mm-hmm. Nate didn't express himself at all in the cage here. Couldn't get anything going. Dos Anjos was picking him apart, laying in leg kicks for leg kicks for leg kicks. Uh, his his thigh was all kinds of different shades of purple and blue and it was bad. everything in between. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we know the Diaz brothers for being emotional characters in, in, in the UFC and in MMA. And, you know, some, some people appreciate that and some people, you know, look bad upon it. It is what it is to me. I, I like it. I respect it to a mm-hmm. certain extent. Um, but he was getting picked up apart. Mm-hmm. I mean, Javier Dos Anjos is known for his leg kicks and they are phenomenal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not to say that uh, Nate Diaz couldn't have defended them, but I just feel like something was different about Nate in this fight. I just don't think he was there all the way. Agreed. I mean, he said he was hurt. He was like, oh, that's why I missed weight. That's why this, that's why that. I mean, right. who knows? Excuses, I mean, excuses. Yeah, I mean, maybe he is, maybe he isn't, but like I said, if the if problem if, is all of this other bad will, it just, yeah, it, it's, it's just doesn't, boy who cried wolf, you know? It's like, well, yeah. can you explain all the rest of the stuff? All the other stuff doesn't make you look good. You say you have an injury, but, well, it's not adding up. So I mean, not only that. I mean, there there's certain measures you can t- when things are going wrong. Uh, 
prior to a fight. Yeah. There's things you can do right still. And some of those things, for example, is like going through with all your interviews and your media without giving anybody any issues. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think they you know said what I mean? we forgot to mention, I think he no-showed a, a media event. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. The, sure, the sure open, he said he, overs- he said he Tuesday overslept. Oh, I overslept. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's just a pile-up. And once you do so many bad things, I think you know in your own mind, I'm, you know, you, you, you almost doubt yourself when you do things like that it's like you're, you start you start telling yourself well I missed weight and I missed the interview and I, I'm, a, I'm a screw up and I'm the, and I think you you know you almost get inside your own head but that, the sad thing is I just don't think he cares I, that's the thing I don't think that he really? got in his own head and lacked any confidence I think that he doesn't care I don't think he, I think he didn't care to show up I think there's other things going on that, that we don't know about and that's speculation it's not to say that I know anything about the Diaz brothers camp so right. um, but yeah he wasn't there mentally in the cage like he normally is mm-hmm. he was tough as hell he took those kicks and threw a head kick uh, you know, yeah, yeah, head kick with that same yeah, was, leg. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. within you know, the beginning so of the third round, it's like, what are you doing? Props that's, to him. That's for, balls. Yeah, yeah, for going all the way. But you know, it's we can we can speculate here and say he, his head wasn't there, or on the fl- the other side of the coin, there it's fair to say there could be a, a, a bigger game here. Maybe not intentionally, or maybe it is that the Diaz brothers don't necessarily want to be in the UFC anymore. You know. Um, it's just my own thought that there is, you know, if their biggest complaint, I'm only uh, hypothetically speculating here, if their biggest complaint now is money and treatment of the fighters, they don't like these uniforms, which I understand them not liking it. That's not a Diaz brother style, you know? No, and we'll um, get to that later. Yeah. Then I can see them saying, you know, there can be other pastures. Um Bellator has deep pockets now through Viacom, whether it's accessible or not. I don't know that either, but theoretically, all right? Um, They have a good relationship, or Nick has had a good relationship, at least in the past, with with Scott Coker. Um, Who's to say that that's not... Um, that's not part of the but bigger picture. But isn't there a more professional way to do it? Isn't there a way that they could, you know, possibly yeah, but say, when have you Dana been, uh, White, I want to break, break my contract? But when have you known the Diaz brothers to act professionally? Right, you know? right. But it's like, it's in my opinion, they're almost doing themselves more harm than good. How do they know that other organizations aren't going to say, well, I saw your last five fights and totally it, it was absolute shit. Why do I yeah. want to sign you anymore? You're not the Diaz brothers that we knew that you, you to were. be two right. years ago, three because years ago. Because he's still a Diaz brother. And right. and that's the that's the back and forth of it. Mm-hmm. Right. You know? Well, yeah, we could argue about this all day. but And I could say, but the hype only lasts as, as long as your game does. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. A couple of more bad fights like this, I would argue that no one would want the Diaz brothers. But when, when you're a fighter... Uh, you believe in your hype a lot longer than right. the rest of the world. Well, rightfully so. Generalization as well. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, but who, who's to say? And well, we have we have Nick against Anderson Silva mm-hmm. coming up soon. So let's wait and say that before we group them as the Diaz brothers because I am really true. excited for that fight. They're um, very separate people. They with, are very separate people. With that said, props to Rafael dos Anjos. Oh. I mean, that guy came and showed. I mean, he very he started point. off. The, the year with a uh, with a loss to Khabib Nurmagomedov um, yeah, <laughs> Khabib and he got hurt so obviously there's a room for a number one contender I think they're pretty much mm-hmm. all but set that uh, Anthony Pettis versus uh, Rafael dos Anjos yeah. Pettis was like dude I want to fight yeah. I want to fight ASAP if mm-hmm. Khabib's hurt, just put me up against Dos Anjos. And that should be a very interesting fight. Because Dana mentioned that in the post-fight press conference. Because yeah. Dos Anjos is here f- for good now. He I is mean, he, tough as yeah. nails. He's mm-hmm. a strong guy in that weight class. He is built thick. Fast. He is fast as all hell. And He's those strong. leg kicks. He is strong. That, I mean, it, it speaks for itself. Uh, look at the leg of Nate Diaz. Mm-hmm. I don't care how on or off your game was. That is damage. Yeah. That is damage. It's like a Rorschach could, test with shades of gray in between. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's so methodical. You know what I mean? He said that was in his game plan. That was part of his camp. He mm-hmm. was practicing those leg kicks. Yeah. And not only how to throw them, but how to set them up mm-hmm. on, on a guy like Nate Diaz. And I think he's going to do the same thing for Anthony Pettis. And uh, if he can land some of those and stun Anthony and maybe slow down. Because uh, Anthony Pettis is one of those guys where his speed is his thing. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? He, he throws fast and he throws from all angles so if he can maybe slow down anthony pettis's game it could really give us a good fight Mm -hmm. that's going to be one of those ones that uh next year we've got all this you know at least the first uh, first quarter or third of the year Uh a lot of big name marquee matches that we're looking at 
this is one that can deliver on that level that a lot of people are going to sleep on until it kind of gets shoved down their throats and go, oh, wait, this is going to be one of those matches? You know, once right. they put, once the UFC puts together a highlight reel and a commercial, there's going to be a lot of buzz on that. But until then, it's only going to be amongst the hardcores saying this is the, this is one to, to, to get anticipated for. Well, if you're listening to our show, guys, you just got a little <laughs> inside scoop. Uh, okay, so next on the card, we have Junior Dos Santos versus Stipe Miochi. Oh, Miochi. my God, this mm-hmm. was a good one. Talk about a war between, I mean, not heavyweights, light heavyweights, but still, talk about a war. Yep. Talk about athleticism. Talk about cardio. Slipping in a, a just one more uh, fight of... Fight of the night or uh, fight of the year candidate. Definitely. Just under the wire before December 31st. Yeah. I mean, they went all five rounds. The mm-hmm. scores being 49-46, 49-46, 48-47 yeah. for, for um, Junior Dos Santos. But it was, I mean, it was a boxing match. It was a boxing match in an MMA cage is and what a, it was. And a, a brutal one with a lot of sweat, a lot of blood. Mm-hmm. And momentum going back and forth. Whether you were clinching in the, uh, against the cage or two guys were throwing headshots at each other, both of them were landing, and some of them would stun each guy, others would not. And mm-hmm. that guy would just keep going. And it's like Robocop versus Terminator, practically, <laughs> you know? What'd but you with think, more fluid action, to be sure. <laughs> it, was a, it was a war. I mean, it, re- it reminded me a lot of last year's heavyweight battle between Mark Hunt and Antonio Silva. Or those guys right. just went five rounds of just beating the crap out of each other. Yeah. And it was just back and forth. Oh, Junior's winning. Oh, Stipe's winning. Oh, but now he's, oh, now he dropped him. Oh, now we just swept him. It's like, I didn't, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to do a little cop out right now. I don't want to score the fight because it really could have gone either way. Each, every single round mm. really could have gone either way. So I know that two of the judges scored at 49, 46. Hey, I don't blame them because mm-hmm. they could have easily went back and forth. And like I said, it was, Junior did probably win four of those rounds by a, a tiny, tiny, tiny yeah. hair of a, you know? Yeah. A, you know? It could have been scored. I, I saw it going both ways. I saw it, I wouldn't have been mad had it gone either way. It was so competitive and so mm-hmm. compelling and brutal at that. We were watching it and I'm sitting there like, oh my God, these, like, just <laughs> imagine getting hit with, with, with strikes that powerful. Um, They were so active and so, so entertaining to watch. I mean, Junior's got power, just as Cain Velasquez. The only guy who ever beat Cain Velasquez. Exactly. He's got, he dropped him in the first round and he became the UFC heavyweight champion with an overhead right. Um, And Stipe just took those. Mm -hmm. Like, and Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not saying that Stipe is tougher than Cain, you know, not not doing making that comparison, but he took a lot of those shots. And I'm very surprised that Stipe didn't go down. That guy's got a jaw that I did not know that he even had. He's Golden Glove champion. So I think that could have had something to do with it. I mean, they both have such a great boxing background. And it's so interesting to see, you know, two guys who are at this point so well rounded in in their MMA game go in there and really stick to one art. It was really interesting to watch that boxing match. Um, I, I saw uh, Junior Dos Santos looking for the overhand right the whole time, mm-hmm. kind of looking to set it up, looking to set it up. He finally landed a couple great ones in that last round, and mm-hmm. whew, did they look yeah. like they hurt? It's Guys, you got to go to YouTube for this part as well. I hope George was in the shot on that one. Uh, <laughs> that just I hope he wasn't. more dubious. Yeah, that's a good point, too. Yeah, uh, I, I don't think we've had, ever had a more dubious... Uh, image there of George trying to quietly and uh, inconspicuously open up a can his of lemon, Sprite. His lemon, his lemon soda. Yeah. With, oh, oh, we're not, we're not being sponsored we by it? Yeah, we're not, we're not sponsored enough. by Sprite. Um, yeah, and, and making it look as dubious as it is, now that we've talked for a minute about it. But uh, it's, if we got it on camera, guys, it's worth, uh, guys on YouTube, or iTunes, it's worth going and checking out the YouTube clip here. Whatever minute. What was this? Uh, 33? So go back to 32.29, I'd say. <laughs> I will say this. Junior won. Stipe lost. I think in no way, shape, or form should Stipe drop in rankings. Because I thought he Fair. gave that fight Fair. just as yeah. much as Junior Dos Santos. And since that fight could have really gone either way, I, I think Stipe should still be considered one of the top five. So where do you put him now? I don't know. Like, I mean, I, w- I, wouldn't, put the, I, don't, I wouldn't put him anywhere. I mean, obviously, Kanan for Doom is next. Mm-hmm. Um... I mean, I, I'm not saying a rematch, but I mean, I'm thinking maybe Travis Brown versus JDS. I was going to say, maybe yeah. hop up. Um, but then again, I don't know where that puts Stipe. Maybe against Mark Hunt. He does have a, uh, I want to say, I wouldn't put him against, because who's, who's Miocic momentum? actually. I mean, you've got Travis I lost say, recently, Miocic right? actually actually lost to Stefan Struve, mm-hmm. um, but I wouldn't put him up against that because I think Stipe would destroy him now. Um, 
But yeah, I don't well, know. those are separate. Uh, I'd, I'd want to see Josh Barnett back in the mix. I mean, I don't yeah. know where his head's at. I know when when we talked to him one time, he was like, "Yeah, don't really. I fight when I fight, you know, when I want to fight." Um, but right. I don't know. I don't yeah. know. Like I said, it's, it's kind of it's a weird the division. game in this white weight class. We have a couple big fights coming Stipe up. Stipe and Andre Arlovsky. Hmm. You do that, and then you. Uh, I, th- I think it'll. Uh, I put my money on Stipe. Quite frankly, it's uh, really? both guys. Both guys are coming off of wins. Correct me if I'm wrong on on Andre. I believe he's. Uh, he, just, he just beat Antonio Silva. That's what I thought. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and you know, Hapa is probably going to wait. He probably wants to see what happens. Uh, uh, see what happens with the heavy bits. Or if he doesn't, if he wants to stay busy, then see, I don't know. Like, I, it, it's, it's that weird division. Hapa that... and Hunt, maybe. Or did we just see that? No. We so just many damn matches. Hunt versus... See, it's it, it, that division <laughs> is... where it's weird because like. Do you put JDS versus Travis Brown? Is it going to be a number one contenders fight? What if JDS wins and Kane wins? It's like, do we want yeah. to see part four? I don't want to see another massacre of JDS, you know? Right. Um, he kind of took a beating yesterday. I mean, who knows when he's going to be ready to fight. That's very yeah. true. So yeah. I, I don't know. That's man. why I hate when they do trilogies so quickly. Like, they give the rematch immediately, then they give the trilogy immediately. Because yeah. it's like, neither guy improved in that amount of time. And then, you know, well, I mean, if you lose three well, times. they this- can. The problem is that with trilogies, uh, back in the day, all right. <laughs> Take us back, Jay. I was going to say seven years ago, <laughs> which I guess kind of is a long time. Um, but when the UFC was doing so fewer shows, right? You you could afford to, for a rematch to, to you could afford to wait longer for a rematch. You know, might have only been a couple of pay per views, but that's like six or eight months or whatever. Or longer, yeah. Yeah, longer. I, I should say. Um, whereas now you've got so many different shows happening. And it being the aware, the public's awareness of the UFC and MMA, um, and the and the UFC's need to build these stars as they were one way of building them up, um, right. whether it's successful or not, sometimes it hits, sometimes it misses. Is these rematches, you know? So if there is a storyline to book a rematch, boom, there's your angle, and you can continue to try and build these guys uh, into mainstream. I awareness. get it, I get it. But now, like you said, now that we have pay per views and you know, UFC certainly every single weekend. Mm-hmm. Like um, uh, uh, Hannah Brow versus Tina Dillashaw, they booked that rematch like ASAP. I think it was yeah. like a couple months after they were already fighting again. It's like, I just like. Well, I think this- there's an academic uh, argument for that as well. Well, yeah. Certain ones are, are so close that you're like, okay, we got to do that again right away, which I get. Or where the champion has such a long, long standing reign. You know, same with uh, right. Silva that and Weidman. Because that Dillashaw Barat was not close at all. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you, you wonder why they do it. But then at the same time, when you see certain rematches, you're like, let them go back into training. You know, let them have a comeback. Mm-hmm. Let, them, let them come like back. Like a tune-up match before a rematch, you think? No, not even that. You could do the rematch right away, but mm-hmm. let the guys go back. Or maybe, maybe a match or two in between. But let the guys go back to their camps. Let mm-hmm. the guys go back to the drawing board. Yeah. And like what fix happened to Robbie on Lawler. something. It's like what happened to Robbie Lawler. Right. He lost. He won two, and then he won the title. But exactly. But while it, Hendricks was on, Robbie yeah. rehabbed himself with those yeah, two yeah. victories. Right. Got himself back into the number one spot yeah. as Johnny was on the shelf. Yeah. Uh, Barrow and Dillashaw. What was that? I want to say it was six months in between, right? Was it was, that long? It was, I feel like it, it was, was May, the, and then it was a May to August. That is a fast turnaround. Yeah, huh? it, it was quick. It, I don't think it was okay. sick, quite six. It, uh, it might have been a couple months, but it was mm-hmm. quick. But funny, you just mentioned something right now, and with all due respect to Junior Dos Santos, I don't think that he improved at all. Like, I don't think he got better from his last fight. I think, you know, right. he got yeah. beat up by Kane. But I don't. I didn't see a new and improved Junior Dos Santos. You didn't see him come out with a different game plan. Yeah, I, I thought it was the same. trying new tools, If right? anything, there were a lot of times where I was like, oh, here we go again. Because I saw a lot of shots to the head where it's like, uh-oh. Mm-hmm. uh-oh. uh-oh. And he, and he, he kind of looked the same, too. If you, looked yeah. at, if you look at his picture from his last fight yeah. with Kane and then his last night's fight, it <clears> wasn't <throat> that much different. His face was all beat up and pulp yeah. and everything. So, again, with all due respect, it's, so it's like... If he wins again, do you give him another title shot if Kane wins? I get it for Dune wins because that, of course, when you have a new champion, it opens up so many new challengers. Um, no, I, you don't do the fourth fight. I think it's just redundant. But if he, w- but if he wins again, then then what do you do with him? You're going to deny him a title shot? It, it, it goes both ways. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh. It's, I see what you're saying. Yeah. You know, I think that we need to see how things play out yeah, in heavyweight just let over the it next play out at least in the division. two to three months here. So maybe switch it up. Maybe put Stipe against Travis Brown. Mm-hmm. Or I don't know. Maybe Junior Santos versus. I'd love to see JDS versus Josh Barnett. 
I wonder if we can find a state that'll let us do Steve Bay versus Travis Brown versus Junior Joe Santos at once. Oh my God. Three Ru- way dance, guys. Actually, I think three Russia, way dance. I think Russia does. does Russia. Th- <laughs> they do like, five on five. Oh, no, was there like a tag team MMA that I saw somewhere? Like a uh, tag team submission wrestling. Yeah. Russia does three on threes too, and it's like you, really? soccer kicks are allowed, and they do it in a sand pit. Really? I've never seen I've this. I've seen this. I've seen this, guys. Well, Russia, Zufa. if it's not you, I'm sorry. Maybe it's like Germany or something, but <laughs> it's somewhere over in Europe. Zufa is trying to crack into the Russian market, so yeah, there, there may be Although, some creative license well, there. Well, I was thinking, too, if... What were you thinking? I know. I never think, and it hurts when I think. <laughs> but they keep talking how if Kane isn't ready in time, mm-hmm. they might just drop the interim from Fabrizio Verdum. Yeah. Well, then, if that's the case, then maybe who should be Verdum's next challenger? The, and that's where you could say JDS. Because actually, yeah. that See, that makes more sense because Junior Dos Santos actually beat Verdun yep. uh, years ago. Right. But it's not going to be the fourth fight of the two of them. Exactly. It was a so. long time ago, and it was, they were very different fighters then, you know? Yeah. But, yeah. but it does... Especially Verdun. Yeah. It does open up the market or the, the, the division to say... To, to book another, a, a number one contender's... Uh, about between somewhere between Miocic and uh, uh, Dos Santos mm-hmm. and who's I just saying um, Hapa. Well, talking about number one contenders, guys. Yeah. Let's let's go over the rest of the card just a little bit, and then we're going to get mm-hmm. into the uniforms before we run out of time here. We do need um, to talk about that. Number one contender Claudia Gadia went mm-hmm. against Joanna and Jacek. Okay, so this was um, a strawweight match. Yep. The night after. The whole the Ultimate Fighter finale played out with the strawweight division, which we will get to at 8 p.m. Right here, guys. Two shows in one night. You'll see us all wearing the same shirts because, <laughs> quite frankly... I'm not wearing the same shirt. But even if you're not, even if you're watching this show on a Monday, just click on one of our other things. I think it's... Wait, if the <laughs> camera is this way, uh, maybe on one of these. Wait, oh, hold on. Don't one click on my head. Okay. One of them. But um, You'll find it. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, Claudia Gadia versus Joanna and Jacek, uh, also 115 straw weights, mm-hmm. played out the night after. But it was very interesting because uh, Carla Esparza, I'm sure, had her eye on this match because the winner was said to be her next opponent. Mm-hmm. Um, and the winner was Joanna and Jacek via split decision. Split decision. They mm-hmm. scored it 29-28 Joanna, 29-28 Claudia, and 29-28 Joanna. A few weeks ago, I was kind of curious on the women's straw weight rankings. I don't, UFC doesn't have them up yet, so I was kind of going to some third part or some other websites. And they actually, a lot of them actually rank Claudia as like number two or number three. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She was, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm almost positive. She was the girl that wasn't allowed in the Ultimate Fighter house because she didn't speak any English. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was three girls that couldn't be in the house for various reasons. One, uh, Paige Van Zandt, because she's not 21. Claudia was because she di- didn't speak any English, so yeah. she couldn't be on the show. But... So she was she was in the UFC's eyes already. She's been on their their radar on their maps. So um, we expected I expected at least her to win this fight. Um, although Joanna and Jacek is no one to sleep on. She is a high high class uh, Muay Thai kickboxing fighter. Yeah, her who, striking was great. Um, yeah, I didn't agree striking. with the with the rounds at all. And you know, we when just, Joe Rogan was talking about how he scored it, I scored it at least the first two rounds opposite to him. So either I wasn't watching closely enough or he wasn't, which is kind of a hard argument to justify. Uh, Uh, Or we just saw different things. Um, Claudia really used her grappling to great effect, I thought. Uh, When she got uh, Joanna, Johanna, pardon me, um, against the cage, there was a lot of ground and pound. She would kind of nullify her, um, you know, clinch up, get her on the ground and uh, and fire rights kind of from a side uh, you know side position yeah there. most of the fight took place place on the cage if it wasn't in the center of the of right. the cage um this is the thing it's one of those matches where you don't under you could score it both ways you could either score it and give it to claudia for <laughs> dominance and control mm-hmm. just, just controlling the fight overall mm-hmm. or you can give it to joanna for more damage done mm-hmm I mean, that's my arguing point. That was for the first round, particularly. I remember we disagreed on that one because Claudia handled most of the uh, the round. She had control for yeah. most of the first round, she, but then Johan- Johanna dropped her bad within like the last 10, 15 seconds. Right, so how do you look at it? Do you look at that mm-hmm. round and say, well, Claudia didn't do anything definitive. She didn't do anything to damage Johanna. And then at the end of the round, Johanna clocked her and dropped her. I have a so thought. So who gets that round? I have a thought. Tell and us. I have a theory. Speak your thought. Here we go. <clears throat> I think at the end of the first round, they gave it to Johanna because of the because she got rocked because uh, mm-hmm. she rocked Claudia Claudia, 
And I think, and I could be wrong, that I think the reason why they gave Johanna the third round is because of that after the bell well, shot. Yeah, we'll get to that. And mm. what I'm saying, I, I think that's why. So it's kind of like, as they were judging, oh, what did she do? Oh, screw that. I'm not going to give her the round then. You know what I mean? So well, was that at the end of the first or the second? Was that the end of the third? At the end of the third. fight. End of the third fight. But they can't go back. I know. And... They can't, but I think they did. Like, I mean, you can't, obviously, so you got your So we go score. see the scorecard, somebody's got a scribble mark No, 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 because it was like, right as they were, maybe they were like, oh, give me 10 seconds to score it. Oh, wait, what happened? Okay, well, now I'm going to, so I don't think they cross. I think right as they're making their decision, they're like, oh, okay. Obviously, you can't prove that. Right. There's no way to to sit there and say, oh, well, this is the reason why I scored. Well, let's, fo- that, let's, it not let's fill them in first. So at the end of the third round, uh, the referee had Joanna on one arm and uh, Claudia on the other arm. He, he clearly had them separated. The round mm-hmm. was over. No big deal. And the buzzer had rang maybe 10 seconds ago and Claudia mm. punched Joanna in the face. Yeah. And yeah. It, it was clearly after the buzzer. There was a referee in between them. <laughs> it was a right that comes from, uh, like like here, as, as if George is the ref. I'm swinging over here. Over, you know. over the ref. Yeah. yeah, yeah, between the ref. And then she pointed to her ears Joanna. and said, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I couldn't. Can't, I couldn't hear. Yeah. She should have pointed to her eyes and her ears, honey, because there was a ref <laughs> standing in between you. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, how you a lot of that. people compared know. it to the Paul Daly situation years ago against Josh Koscheck, um, where Paul Daly did that, and of course he got banned from the UFC for life. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people were thinking, why? The, why didn't that happen? According to Dana White, he said because she immediately apologized. She was like, "Oh, I'm so sorry," as opposed to Paul Daly, who just didn't give a crap. Yeah. Was like, yeah, I did. Right. It, it, it wasn't the malicious, the fight's over, I still want to mess you up kind yeah. of punch. Mm-hmm. Even if it was that initially, she acted like it wasn't. Yeah, because that's her, that's her defense. Right. Yeah. Well, good but for does her that for defending defense, it that way. Yeah. Yeah. But does that defense hold water? I don't. I personally don't think it should. I don't think, I don't think, again, I think, I think she hit her. Um, but again, I think that's why the judges might have scored it third round for her well it's a good you can argue that point because i mean the judges probably didn't have the scores written down yet because yeah the, the, the i just, round think they, I just think they had it written down yet it's not like they crossed it i don't think they crossed anything out i just think that they were about know. to put you know nine or ten or whatever oh wait what okay yeah no, i'm gonna give it to joanna because it, it of would that. be the honestly if the, it was something like that i believe in terms of disqualifying or penalizing a fighter for points that's the referee's uh, discretion. That's the referee mm-hmm. to tell the judges deduct a point, one point deduction. Yeah, he didn't do that, mm-hmm. and it was technically after the bell. Yeah. There probably should be some, uh, some you know, uh, what's the word? Repercussions? Not repercussions, but um, consequences. Authority. Excuse me. Authority for the referee. Seconds right after the the bell uh, stops. You know, if the fighters get out of hand, you know, you, the referee should be able to deduct I, a point. But he didn't in that case. So I, I looked don't at see you it. guys as soon as it happened, and I said, yeah. "Who do you blame?" You said Claudia and you said Claudia, right? No, no, no. That was for the other one. That was for the um, the other fight. With, uh, the, um, with uh, John, John Moraga, Moraga and Wapess and uh, Willie Wesley. Gates. Yeah, Willie Gates. Yeah. Oh, that was another one. That's yeah. right. But but you, I mean, looking at that situation, I blame the ref. The ref should have really separated them. Well, and he was uh, in between. His body was in between them. Yeah. Because you kind of like you see all the time where but even after the bell she punched rings, her, the ref barely did. But anything. you hear, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. There's only so much you can do. But it's like you see, you see a lot of time where the the I, I get it. They didn't, maybe they didn't hear it. Whatever. But a lot of times they do hear it. So it's kind of like if you're a ref, you don't expect that to happen. You think that That's once true. you put your hands exactly. around arms around right. your fighters, you think that they got, in addition to hearing the buzzer, that oh well maybe this is good enough. I mean. Maybe the maybe the ref will now be like, all right, cool, the fight's over, fight's over. Right. You know, because you got to sit there and you know jump around, say that the fight's over. There should be a, you're <laughs> right. There should be a certain amount of professionalism in the fighters, and they are held to the UFC standard now. And I think there should be some sort of repercussion, um, whether it was an accident. I don't know. It's yeah. hard to say, but clearly, if you apologize for stuff, you can get away with it but, pretty easily. <laughs> yeah, we only have a couple minutes left, so let's get into the uniform thing, guys. We yes. mentioned it briefly uh, last week, but I really want to talk about it a little bit more. I'm Obviously, sure a lot of our fans you, have probably heard about them yeah, by now. Uh, Reebok and UFC have have formed a contract, a very big one, mm-hmm. uh, saying that all the UFC fighters will now wear Reebok designed uniforms. Although the fighters will have a say in what the uniforms look like, colors, styles, designs, all of that stuff, uh, they will be sponsored by Reebok and Reebok no, only. No yeah. other outside sponsors, no banners, and no other sponsorships during the entire fight week. Mm-hmm. So you cannot wear any logos besides Reebok your entire fight week. Including, uh, yeah, the open workouts, any media stuff that's Anything you do organized by week. the UFC. 
that has to do with the UFC. I, th- right. I think it's going to be adjusted. I don't think there's going to be strictly no Reebok. No, I mean, I'm sorry, obviously all Reebok, no nothing, no Gatorade, no nothing. I think it's just going to be, I think it's a lot, I think it's like a lot more lenient than we think. But we're just gonna have to wait and see. Well, I think right now it's mm. as strict as they're saying it is. I think what you're saying is it might it might change in the future. I just don't think it's gonna be as bad as everybody thinks. It will uh, alter. I'm sure it will change. But what is it? Um, I think one part of it is the the pay structure. That's a big part of uh, the conversation. Is mm-hmm. how these fighters are their their paychecks are going to be uh, um, affected. Will the lower guys benefit that much more? Will the higher guys be hurt, and by how much? Right. Or will the lower guys and the middle guys, for that matter, be hurt? Dana White quote said that the champions will make just as much, if not more, and the lower guys will benefit significantly. But it's hard to say. I mean, you can't look at everybody's numbers and, and make that general statement and say that for a fact because there are a lot of you know independent sponsors out there, mm-hmm. MMA sponsorships, you know, brands like Bad Boy and Virus and all of those people that – are going to yeah. lose out. The idea is that this is a larger corporate sponsorship and that everybody will share a, a piece of the pie. This gets rid of a lot of other uh, fight brands or fight brands or sponsors that have stiffed either uh, fighters in the past and not paying them. Mm-hmm. Uh, some fighters have gone very public about that. Yeah, um, absolutely. Or also fight, uh, brands that have not been able to pay or don't pay the, the sponsor tax. To the UFC, there's a lot of people, a lot of casual fans don't, might not know. There's a fee that you have to pay. Sometimes it's as much as twenty thousand dollars. Sometimes it's less. Uh, you pay to the UFC in order for the right to sponsor the fighters. Absolutely. So there's two, two bits that you're you're paying there. You know, two checks you're writing. But it puts it, it gives those those sponsorships, those companies, a higher platform of of marketing. You know what I mean? I think it was good for those smaller companies that got to get their name out there if they could afford it. Um, but the question is then, um, with, you know, with Reebok fighters, lower level fighters can say they're sponsored by Reebok. There's a high level of prestige there. Right. That's good. But at the same time, um, it, it does minimize how much or it, it, it limits how much a fighter can get paid just for uh for being a fighter. It, it, it's like it just the, sets, And this comes into the conversation, the ranking system and how fighters are paid. Yeah, there's a five-tier system that they put in place. So yeah. the champions are going to get a specific amount, the top five, the top 10, top 15, so on and right. so on. I like it. I'm going to say this real quick because we have to wrap up. I like it for one reason, and I, uh, you know, I have a capitalist mentality, but at the same time, I like our sport to grow, and I like seeing our sport do things where – we're kind of coming together as one and putting a bigger brand on ourselves. Mm-hmm. So I think when people see, turn on the TV and every single uniform says Reebok UFC or whatever they're going to say on it, yeah. I think it brands us and I think it lets the casual fan and, and the rest of America see, oh, that's the UFC. Yeah. And I think it, it just lets them associate more with us. And that's why I like it personally. But uh, we can get into it more on our said, 8 p.m. show, uh, The uh, Ultimate Fighter Recap. Are we going to get Reebok? Maybe. Can we get like some Reebok beanies and some hats and some zippies and some hoodies? And- Lenny, I'm going to email you about this, all right? <laughs> we'll get to our UFC contact about that. Uh, anyway, guys, like I said, we're going to be back at 8 o'clock with a whole nother hour of MMA talking about the Ultimate Fighter finale. So it's almost not even worth it to give our social media. Yeah, because we're, not, even, we're not leaving you guys. Just come back at 8. <laughs> well, no, just no. Because what if people are going to watch the UFC but not the Ultimate Fighter? Just oh, in case. You never point. know. I think you can good. find me. <laughs> you can find me at G Hermosa. It should be right here at G Hermosa on Twitter and at Instagram. Don't follow me on Facebook. You can message me. You can message me on Facebook, but don't don't think because I won't add you. I'm just being honest. I'm over here at J Tan seven one six at the usual big three social media. Um, Mom, I clear history after every time I go on, so you're not gonna find anything. So yeah. just quit yeah. trying, okay? Wait, by the way, I, I want to just say, if I ever die, can you delete my internet history on my computer? <laughs> yeah, I got you covered. Okay, her to do it or to me to do it? It doesn't matter as long as it's okay. done. As long as someone <laughs> does <laughs> it. We all know what's on there, right, Jay? We know what's on there. <laughs> I don't yet, thank God. Guys, you can find me at DarryB28 on all your social media, except for Facebook. You can find me at Darry the Jersey Devil Baronado. I will be fighting February 7th for California Fight League up in Adelanto, California. You can get tickets. Uh, just message me or hit me up on social media, and I will get them to you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Hit me up. Let it right, be. Now. right now. Right okay, now. Guys, we were seeing at 8 p.m. for the Ultimate Fighter finale. We're going to talk about so many amazing fights and the new and first straw weight champion. But we're Carlos actually going to be here next week, too. Who, oh, right, the next know. UFC fight uh, uh, next week on Fox First One. Who do you have? CB Dalloway versus Leona Machida. Leona Machida. Who do you have? Buzz you later. All right, I guess I got CB Dalloway.
from executive producers Maria Manunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Buzz, Buzz you later. Buzz, Buzz, Buzz. Views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.